It's to his words we want to turn tonight in Matthew's Gospel, uh, Matthew chapter 6, and continue to learn what he is teaching us about prayer. I'm going to read uh, this text and kind of remind you of what we spoke of last time and go through uh, pretty much the rest of the Lord's Prayer uh, with his help tonight. Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 7, it says, But when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathens do. For they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things you have need of before you ask him. After this manner therefore pray ye, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I know that's familiar to all of you. Many of you who grew up in church probably memorized that when you were children in Sunday school. Maybe got up and recited it before the church uh, as a child. And we saw in this prayer that Jesus is teaching us right before this that we're not to be like the heathen who just vainly repeat empty phrases, even though being good words, but they're empty words because it's just repetition, meaningless repetition. And the reason that we don't pray that way is that our God is omniscient. Our God is omniscient. In fact, we had learned just a few verses earlier that we don't have to pray out in public to be seen because our God is omnipresent. And so we've seen this pattern that who our God is defines who we are to be and how we are to practice our religion. That's, that's the pattern we see here as Jesus is going through um, the Sermon on the Mount. You need to know your God. And, and not just in terms of having a relationship with Him, because that's where it starts, is to know the Lord, but to lean in and to know Him more and more, because the, know you, the more you know about Him, the more you're changed, the more your life is transformed to be like Him, the more you know how to worship Him in a way that pleases Him. Kind of like Jesus was telling the woman at the well. We talked about it this morning. God is a spirit. And because of that, because God sees on the inside, not the outside, he needs to be worshipped in spirit and truth because he doesn't look at you all like we look at each other and just see the externalities. He's a spirit and he sees exactly what's going on in your heart. And so because of the way he is, who he is, that defines how we have to worship. And it's the same principle right here in prayer. And so what I was challenging us to do was to look at the Lord's Prayer in a new way, to look at this and say, what is this telling me about God? Because Jesus is wanting us to understand who he is so that we approach him in the right way. And we started off um, looking at the Lord's Prayer, our Father which art in heaven, and we, th we thought about that. What, is that. what does that tell us about God? Well, it tells us, it tells us that God is a person, that he is relational. He's not just a force or a power, but he is a person who is able to have a relationship, and he expresses that relationship as like a father to a child. That's a point of reference we all can have. Uh, hopefully, we all have fathers in our lives or people who were in a father relationship to us in some way, and we know how that works. Well, that gives us a point of reference for how we can go to him. And that he is a spirit. He is in heaven. The next thing was, hallowed be thy name. We thought about that. We talked about that. To hallow is to revere as being holy, unique, and treasured. He has a name. He has a reputation. And he is over all things. And he is holy. There is nobody else comparable to him. And so we have these two 
two truths out here that are kind of in the introduction to this prayer that he is holy completely separate and different and yet he is our father and we are called to go to him that we have this access to him that is absolutely amazing and so right there in just the opening words of the Lord's Prayer that we can just rattle off our tongues our father that which art in heaven hallowed be thy name right there are all these amazing truths about God and how he relates to us and so I, I want us to see those things as we go through this Lord's Prayer. We're going to go in now to this next part, verse 10. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And I will grant you that the kingdom of God is a challenging topic. And it could be something that we could spend a lot of time looking into. And I will be honest that I, I can't say that I understand all the edges of this because it's, it's one of those things that uh, in scriptures, it's presented as something that's already here and yet it's not here in its fullness. Jesus told his disciples, the kingdom is among you. But then we know that there is a yet to come aspect. It is already broken in. And so there is a sense in which the kingdom is present among us and yet we're waiting for the consummation of the kingdom. And so that concept is put into this prayer, and I don't want to overcomplicate it. I just want us to look at these words here, and it says, Thy kingdom come. He is a king. Okay? So he is a king. Can we all agree that he is a king? And he has a kingdom. And so he is a person. He is relational. He is our Father, but He is holy, 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 and He is a King. And so as we come to Him in prayer, we get to approach Him in all of these different ways, and part of it is as a sovereign ruler who has a purposeful reign and a rule. He has a will that He wants to accomplish in His reign and in His kingdom. And what we learn in this prayer is we're praying, Thy kingdom come. So you're a king. We want the fullness of your kingdom to be realized. May your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. So he is a king in heaven and he is a king on earth. He is king of kings. He is king over all. And we also learn from this that there is a place where his rule and his reign is currently presently exercised perfectly. And that is in heaven. In heaven, his rule and his reign is all carried out perfectly. Everyone in that place is doing exactly what he wants, when he wants. His reign is fully, completely expressed in that place. But there is also this area that's under his jurisdiction, that is the earth, but where his will is not being perfectly followed. Now, understand, he still is in charge. And he can make things happen here. And he has set forth things that are going to happen here. And all of what he has decreed will be accomplished. But yet at this time, there's a lot of things that are happening that are not what he wants to happen. There are things that he's allowing to happen. Okay, it's just part of his permissive will. <clears throat> but people are not living in accordance with his divine will. And so as we're coming to the Lord in prayer, this, this passage here, this portion of the prayer is teaching us a lot. We're coming to him as a king, and we are coming to him and we are praying about this area in which we live, because this is a prayer you pray on earth, not a prayer you're going to pray in heaven, okay? We are praying because we're here on this earth and he is king over this, but not everything's happening according to his plan. We are praying for God's will to be accomplished here we are praying for God's will to be accomplished here and as children of the kingdom as we are praying this this is kind of teaching us to pray about submitting ourselves to the king okay there's a sense in which we're praying how, how do you pray thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven but not really me I kind of want to do what I want to do but I hope you get the rest of them that, that's not sincerely praying the Lord's Prayer. Part of this is teaching us, and again, this is a model prayer. It's teaching us that we need to submit to his reign. Kind of like a Romans 12, 1 and 2, that we present ourselves a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto him, which is our reasonable service. 
That kind of sense in which we are, we are, as we're praying this, it's, it's about teaching us to come to the Lord and submit to his will. Thy will be done in my life. Your purposes help me to be a vessel to accomplish your purpose as a citizen of your kingdom. That is really kind of, I'm out of place here. I'm an alien in this world because I'm of your kingdom, but I am here, but I am an ambassador in a sense of your kingdom, and I need to be submitted to your will, and I need to be doing kingdom business here in this world. So help me to do that. But there's also a sense in this prayer, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, that we are praying and we're looking forward to the day it's consummated. The fullness of his glory and the fullness of his reign is coming. And we keep that in our minds as we pray because that's a promise. That's a promise of things that are to come. And so there's a part of our prayer, just like the earth. And I preached a few weeks ago about the earth longing. We are longing for the Lord to return. We are longing for all things to be set right. And that is part of our prayer and the way that we go to him. You know, tonight, Sister Kathy was asking us to pray for our country. Why? Because things are crazy. Things are crazy. And we want, in a sense, his will to be done here. We think that would benefit this place. It'd be a whole lot better if there was more submission to his will. And we know that even on its best day, and the United States has had some wonderful days in our past, and even, even, even our present is way better than a lot of places in this world. But even on our best days, we are a far shadow and a far cry from the way it's going to be when the Lord comes back. Amen? It's a far shadow, a far cry from the way it's going to be when the Lord completely exerts his reign over all things and he gets rid of all rebellion completely. And so there is a sense of longing in our prayers. But there's something else that we see here and I want to bring this out. As we're praying, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. There is only really besides the fact that I as a citizen of his kingdom, I can surrender myself and I can try to accomplish his purposes. But one of the primary ways in which thy kingdom come, thy will be done can be accomplished in this world is by more people coming into his kingdom. Amen. He's a savior. He is a king, but he is a savior who can come in and transform and take the rebels in this world and transform them into children of the kingdom. Because isn't that every one of our testimonies? Amen. It's every one of our testimonies that we have been rebels against God. But he has come and he's saved us and he's transformed us from the kingdom of this world of darkness into children of light. And so part of this praying, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, that's where you put evangelistic prayer. That's where you put evangelistic prayer in the Lord's prayer because we are praying for there to be more people saved and transferred into the kingdom and people wanting to serve the Lord and be baptized and become disciples so that his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so you see this model prayer, we read through it, we don't necessarily think about all the implications, but we see right there in that passage, and I know I'm probably missing things, he's a king, and he is a savior who can change and transform. We go now to this next portion in verse 11. Give us this day our daily bread. We see here that he is a provider. God is a provider, and we are going to God to give us the things we need. And here in this model prayer, the Lord mentions and uses as an example the very most basic of things. You need a meal. You need to eat on a daily basis, unless for some reason you're, you're fasting for a purpose or whatever reason, I mean, you need to eat. You're, I mean, you're, you're built to eat every single day. 
And I believe this is representative of not just that he gives us our meal, but he gives us all things richly that we stand in need of. This just uses the most basic of things. But you could put in here, you know, my clothing. You could put into this, you know, the relationships that I need in my life today. Give me the shelter that I need. Give me the wisdom that I need. Give me, you know, whatever it is that I stand in need of, Lord, give me today what I need. And so we're looking to God as a provider. But as we look at this, we understand we're not just asking for God to just kind of, you know, make food materialize in front of us, but we understand that there is a process to go through to get food. And that process that God's designed to get food is called work. All right? In fact, Paul said, look, if somebody's not going to work, don't let them eat. There's a process by which we go through to get our daily food and to get our shelter and to get our clothes and to take care of those things. That is the process of working to be able to have the resources to do that. So as we look at this, we're looking at God as a provider, but we're also recognizing that God is our strength because we can't do these things that need to be done unless God gives us the ability to do it. Now, Jesus is not telling us just to, for God to pray for us to get food and then do nothing. There is an expectation in harmonizing scriptures that we would go and do those necessary things, but at the same time recognizing, Lord, help me do what I need to do. Give me the job that I need to be able to make this provision in my life. Give me the strength to do it today. Give me the wisdom and the insight. Give me the patience so I don't kill my coworkers. Whatever it is you stand in need of, Amen? That God is our strength. He is a provider and He is our strength to do the things that we need to do, that He's called us to be involved in. We need Him for our strength. And so this is so broad. But also I want to point out that this says, give us this day, today, our daily bread. Today. Today. Meaning that this prayer, this model to us is teaching us right in the midst, in the words here, that, this, that prayer is meant to be a daily thing. And the way God wants to function in our lives is very much like that Old Testament concept of manna, right? Where they had to go out six days a week and gather that Saturday, or excuse me, Friday for them. They got to gather twice as much so they could rest on their Sabbath, Saturday. Otherwise, they were out there every day gathering, and they only could get what they needed for that day, with one exception, for the Sabbath. And anything extra they gathered, it rotted. So they had to go out there and every single day go and gather that manna. And it was teaching them, building a habit into their life of depending upon God every single day. And that's why, you know, if you pray today, you know, and you joined in as part of this service this morning and you were praying and trying to dedicate your life and your home to the Lord and you were praying for God to have strength to be able to do that, guess what? You're going to need to pray about that again tomorrow. And you're going to need to pray about that again on Tuesday. You just can't, a one and done. That, that's, that's not how it works. That's not the way God's meant us to function. Because if we start trying to do that, we're trying to live on our own strength. And we'll find out pretty soon that we're just not doing it the right way. And so what the Lord is wanting to call us to do is to come to Him on a daily basis, meaning that He is, this is teaching us that He's a provider and He's our strength, but He is also daily engaged with our lives. If we had eyes to see, we would see that every single day of our life, our God is working and moving and doing things for us. Every single day. And you could probably honestly say every single hour, every single moment, He is working. He is working on our behalf, and most of the time, we're blind to it. Most of the time, we don't see all of what He's doing. Many of the people Jesus was preaching to were paid 
every day. They lived hand to mouth. They didn't have six months wages stored up, stocked up. It didn't happen. Most of those people went out and worked and they got that money and they went and they bought food and they paid anything they had to pay that day because everybody was kind of day by day. And this really resonated with those people. And God has put us in a position where spiritually we are hand to mouth. We're hand to mouth. And we're never going to be more than that. We're going to be hand to mouth. And that's okay. That's what he's called us to. Here in verse 12 it says, And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And I'm only going to really cover part of this, but I have to read that whole thing. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And the reason I'm going to jettison part of this until a future time is that you'll see when you get down to verse 14 and 15, the Lord expounds on this and says, For if you forgive men their trespasses, the Heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you don't, then you won't receive forgiveness. So I'm going to talk about that aspect of that more at a future time. But what I want to point out is that there is this part of approaching God in our daily prayer where we need to ask Him to forgive us of our debts. What we need to understand from this passage is that He, God, is the victim. God is the victim, the primary victim of our sin. Every single sin we commit, every single sin is against God. Sin is sin because it is defying what He has said. He's the one who established the law, who's established the truths whereby we measure what's good and what's bad. And He didn't just make up some arbitrary rules. Those rules are a reflection of His character. It's a reflection of who He is. That's why when Jesus came and the way he lived, you could look at that and say, that's perfection. And that, that was the law. That was the fulfillment of the law. And that was perfection because Jesus simply was who he was, which is perfect. That's where those laws came from. And so every single sin we commit is necessarily against God. Think about David as he wrote Psalm 51 after he had committed adultery with Bathsheba and had her husband essentially killed to hide his sin after Bathsheba became pregnant. David writes Psalm 51 and he pins in that, against thee and thee only have I sinned. Now when I think about that, I think, well, you sinned against Bathsheba and you sure sinned against Uriah. I mean, you certainly, you know, were sinning against several people when you did all these things, and that is absolutely true. But what is so significant about David's confession was that he saw how horrible the greatest victim of his sin was God because of the way he acted. Even though there were others involved in this who were damaged, it was primarily God who David offended. That was Psalm 52, I apologize. But... You see that sense of recognizing how much we harm God. Jesus told the parable of the unforgiving servant in Matthew's gospel, Matthew 21. And that servant was forgiven 10,000 talents. And that servant then went out after being forgiven 10,000 talents and he took a man who owed him 100 denarii and sent him to the debtor's prison. Have you ever looked at the conversion for a talent versus a denarii? Because that servant was forgiven 10,000 talents. A single talent was the equivalent of 20 years wages. An equivalent of 20 years wages would be a talent of gold. And a denarii was a single day's wage for the average worker. So if you were to compare 10,000 talents versus 100 denarii, you were looking at 200,000 years of debt versus 100 days. Wow. 
200,000 years of labor versus 100 days. And the point of that parable was to put into perspective our sin against God compared to the sins that have been committed against us. The Lord is not negating that we get sinned against. In fact, it's right here in the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, people who have sinned against us. But what he's drawing our hearts to understand as we look at those other passages is that what we have done to God is way, way, way worse than what anyone has ever done to us. And Jesus is wanting us, and that's, it's connected there. And you see the connection, and we'll talk about that more at some future time, but there is this connection. Forgive us as we forgive. That he's wanting us to pull these things into focus, the 200,000 years of work and the 100 days of work into the same lens in our minds as we think about asking God to forgive us and then we think about being willing to forgive others because it puts it in the right perspective that we need in our hearts. Finally, lead us not into temptation. This is right before the finale here. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. That's in verse 13. This is a potentially confusing passage. I want to draw your attention to that three-letter word that comes after the comma in verse 13, but. It's a significant conjunction joining and contrasting these two statements. And so to understand the lead us not in a temptation, we have to understand the but deliver us from evil. Okay? Those things have to be put kind of side by side to help us understand what's being said right there. Because each part contributes to our understanding of the whole. When we look at this passage, part of the reason it's confusing is because we hear temptation, we think temptation to evil, if you're reading this in the King James. But we also understand in James 1.13 that it says, let no man say when he's tempted that I am tempted of God, because God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he, tempteth he any man. God never tempts anybody to evil. So there's no reason to pray, God, please don't tempt me to evil, because he's never going to do it. He's not. Ever ever, ever, ever. He's never going to tempt you to evil. But if you'll recall, a few months ago, we talked about what's the difference between a trial and a temptation and a test. Remember that? The difference between a trial and a temptation and a test. And it's all about perspective. Okay? We, from our perspective, can experience a trial. In that trial, Satan can try to tempt us to evil. But at the same time, God may be testing us to prove us, to grow us, and mature us. And th so a trial and a temptation and a test could even be the same event, but you've got three different things going on at the same time. Satan drawing us into temptation to do evil. God testing us and we are enduring what we feel like is a trial. So how do we pull this together? God is never tempting us to evil. It says, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Evil there, I believe, means the evil one. Deliver us from the evil one. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from Satan, the devil himself. What we're praying here is we're looking to God as our sovereign, as our king, as our deliverer, and asking him, please do not allow us to be taken into trials, temptations that can result in a fall or a failure. Lord, please put your hedge about us. Please protect us from the enemy. Or to the extent that you decide sovereignly to allow this to come to pass in my life, please moderate this trial. These things that come into my life that I may not be delivered or fall unto the hands of the devil. 
We're asking God to be a protector and a deliverer to us. We need to constantly be aware that we've got an enemy and he prowls around like a lion looking for those that he may devour. We're told to be watchful for him. We're told to stay awake and never let him catch us unaware. And this is part of where we pray for that, part in a daily prayer, to be aware of the fact that we have an enemy that is trying to destroy us, trying to destroy our reputation, trying to destroy our homes, trying to destroy our marriages, trying to destroy our church, our relationships, all these things, our country. He is a destroyer. And this is part of that act of spiritual warfare prayer, asking our God, our protector, our deliverer, to watch over us, help us, limit these things, help us to stand and not to falter. And we come then to the conclusion, and I hope as you see all this kind of unfolded and we're thinking about who God is, you're seeing this kind of resonate with other things you hear in Scripture about things that we need to be on top of all the time. And it ends here in verse 13, For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And I recognize some of you in your, your Bible translation, you may not have that last part of verse 13. That's because it's, it's not in some of the oldest Greek manuscripts that are used for some of the uh, other translations. I'm not going to get into all that, but I will say that this last part of verse 13, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, amen, it's very reminiscent of some Old Testament prayers. David prayed in 1 Chronicles 29, 11. He said, yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. That was part of David's prayer. And it's also reminiscent of something Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 6. It says, He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. What we see is this, whether people debate about whether it's in there or not, it does not contradict this text, this prayer, and it doesn't contradict the rest of Scripture. And what I think is, is good about this as it comes to the end is it reminds us as we pray and as we're coming to the conclusion of a study on prayer that this is about His plan. This is about Thy will be done. It's about His power because we can't do a bit of it without His help and His strength. And it's about His glory. It's about His name being made great, not about our reputation, not about our kingdom, not about power. It is all about His. And coming, and we kind of started like a book, like, like bookends to this, starting the prayer off thinking about who He is and what He's about and surrendering ourselves to it and even ending the prayer in that same kind of spirit helps us to pray in a way when we pray in this way, with that kind of spirit, these are the kind of prayers that Jesus said, ask what you will, and you will receive it. When we pray in this kind of spirit, Jesus says, ask what you will, and you will receive it. How do I pray like that? He taught us how to pray like that. Those things forming and informing our prayers will help us to pray, to pray prayers that will have answers coming down from heaven. Prayers that will be blessed. Prayers that will be fruitful to accomplish His purposes. And that is an access we have that we can go to Daddy. We can go to Daddy in this way. And He welcomes us and He hears us and He is ready to be a good dad and give freely all things that we stand in need of. I hope that this inspires you to pray, and I hope that it, it's something you meditate and you chew on um, to help you grow and deepen your prayer life. Does anyone have anything on your heart this evening before we uh, have a song 
and open the doors of the church. All right, well, Brother Brian, we're going to go ahead and have a song as we do at a uh, business meeting. And uh, we're going to stand and open the doors of the church and we receive members by testimony of salvation always in all circumstances. If you've not been baptized scripturally, we ask that you would submit to baptism here at HNBC. If you are a member of a, ch a church of like faith and order, we would accept a, a letter from that church. And finally, if that church doesn't exist or we can't exchange a letter, we would accept uh, you upon statement. And so as we stand and sing, we'll open the doors of HNBC.